Before I uh, kind of dive into the sermon this morning, I, I want to just have a moment, if we can, to sort of talk as a church family for a little bit. I, uh, um, as many of you know, some of you may not know, it was just about this time last year that we began a, a launch team out of Chapel Street Church, began to meet together over at our South Street campus in our student center to begin to prepare for the opening of this campus. We had rallied families together and we had met over the course of the months. We trained children's ministry volunteers and um, got all this preparation going and we were praying together and, and it was an incredible, incredible time. Um, I loved it. And, and now that we're sort of at that year mark um, and we're, we're doing church together, we're, we're, this is happening, it's reality now, we're experiencing this each and every week. And yet for me, the vision is, is no less paramount. The, the call for us to be a neighborhood church and to reach our neighborhood and for you and I to be chapels on our streets is, is no less at the forefront a year later. In fact, we want to make sure that that remains very much our calling and what we're about. And so I have felt lately that, that, that we're at a season now where it's sort of a, a, an opportunity to gather together again in order to put the vision in front of us, in order to remain focused on what we believe God has put us here in this community to be about and to do. And one year ago, we had a designated group of people that were meeting for that purpose. But over the course of this year, lots of you have joined that vision. You've joined this community, you call Chapel Street Church, Mill Creek, your church home. And, and so I wanna open this up to all of you in August, and we're still working on the details, so you're gonna hear about this over the next couple of weeks, but we're gonna plan a time for us to gather together in this space to, for, to share the vision a little bit, but, but more importantly, we want to invite you into that vision. We, we wanna share more in detail about why we believe God has placed us here and, and ways that you can be involved, opportunities like we talked about, to serve, opportunities to connect, opportunities to, to stay focused on that which we believe God has set in front of us as a church. And I'm excited to share all of that with you as we continue to seek his face and, and seek uh, his, his work here in, in this community and beyond. I hope you will consider and, and pray about being a part of that. Um, just a couple weeks ago, I, I had the opportunity to take my two oldest daughters down to see uh, Hamilton. It's part of my, my, my oldest daughter's 16th birthday. We had gotten a few tickets. My daughters and I love listening to the music. We, we jam out in the car to it all the time. And so we surprised her. We got her these tickets and, and the three of us went down together. Has anybody seen Hamilton in here? Several of us. It's an incredible show. Um, it's very entertaining. And, and we loved the whole evening together. Um, and, and yet when you think about the story though, it's an incredibly tragic event in, in U.S. history. You think about two who by all measures seem like brilliant men, Aaron Burr and, and Alexander Hamilton, who can't find a way to resolve conflict outside of staring at each other, you know, 10 feet apart with guns. It seems unreasonable. In fact, just this last week on July 11th, it was the 214th anniversary of the duel between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton that, as you know, would ultimately end up in Hamilton's death. And, and when you think about that, you, this is this, one of the, Aaron Burr was the sitting vice president of the United States at the time. I mean, it seems unreasonable, infantile, that, 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 so unnecessary that, that a conflict of this nature would, would need to result in this sort of event. And yet when you study historically, you also understand that duels of this type were not all that uncommon uh, 200 years ago. It was relatively uncommon that it would end in somebody being shot, but this is the second time in the Hamilton family that on that exact spot in New Jersey where they lost a member of their family in a duel. And it seems like there's gotta be a better way. Is this really how we're going to settle these sorts of events? And, and James, and we're going to look at this today, James is writing this letter to the early church. And as he's teaching the church, he is going to look at and kind of compare and contrast two different types of, of wisdom. 
Two, two ways of understanding and living out our, our faith, living life in, in light of who God is. One that is characterized, James will say, by selfish ambition and bitter envy, which ultimately leads to death, a la Hamilton. And one that James says is marked by being peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. It's this wisdom, according to James, that leads to peace and to life. This is what James is going to call true wisdom. And perhaps it's not surprising that when James is going to start teaching on the nature of wisdom and and telling the church what true wisdom looked like, he says, you're going to know which which manner of wisdom you're living under based on the actions of your life, based on, on your deeds. It'll be on display, whether we're living with false wisdom or living with with godly wisdom. Let's, let's pray together before we open God's word. Father, we do pray that this morning as we look in your word that you would reveal to us more of you. And Lord, that we would live from a wisdom that comes from your nature and character. Do this in us as your church. Do this in us as followers of Jesus. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Let's turn to James chapter 3. As you know, if you don't know, we've been um, reading through, working through, studying together the book of James throughout the course of the summer. We're about halfway through the book now, and, and this is what James writes. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. As we begin to look at this, this text this morning, I want to I start by looking at the meaning of wisdom. What is it that James talks about? What is he teaching the church when he talks about wisdom in our lives? And I think at the outset, it's important to recognize for James that wisdom is more than knowledge. It's more than knowledge. Let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Uh, early on in my student ministry days, I was a youth pastor in, in Wheaton, and I had this kid, this uh, young man that would come and sit down and kind of set up some time to meet with me, and he was always looking for uh, relationship advice, um, which the fact that he was coming to me for that made, made question his wisdom at the outset, but, but he would come and sit down, and he, he, would, he would tell me what was going on, and, and, and I would share with him, and it was kind of obvious from the circumstances he found himself in that maybe he was in need of some advice, and and so I would give him some suggestions, and, and he, would, he would hear those suggestions. He would take that in. He would even agree with those suggestions and say things like that. That sounds right. Okay, I think that would probably be a good thing to do, or maybe I shouldn't have said that, or, or, or whatever. And that he would walk out my door and do whatever it is that he wanted to do, like constantly. Like this happened probably four or five times. Oh, can I, you know, it, this, this happened, this didn't go on. It's like, well, but I told you not to do that. Did we, we had this conversation. You remember, we went through this and we said, and he's like, yeah, but I just really felt this way. And, and, and eventually it got to the point where this kept happening. And I said, I'd stop coming. Stop, stop setting up time to meet with you because you're just going to ignore everything that, that I tell you. See, this particular student, he had all of the information. He even, I think, cognitively agreed with the information, but, but he didn't live it. He, he had all of the knowledge, but he lacked wisdom. See, when James is, is asking this rhetorical question here, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. 
See, James here at this question in that following statement, he, he serves to help us understand what he means when he talks about wisdom, that this is, this is more than cognitive information. Wisdom, according to James, is that intersection between understanding and practice. It's, it's the intersection between understanding and, and activity or the way that we live our lives, as one commentator put it, it's being knowledgeable in a way that makes one effectual in the exercise of such knowledge. So, so once again, for James, his, his primary concern, or I should say his, his exclusive concern, is not that, that we have information. It's not so much about what we know or what we believe. He's already pointed that out, right? Even the demons, so you believe in God, even the demons do that. And they shudder. He's, he's more concerned, rather, about how the knowledge, our knowledge of who Jesus is and his grace in our life ultimately reveal itself in the way that we live our lives. That, that's what James is concerned about. He's concerned about alignment. I, I, uh, it helps me to think of it this way. If all of us live with technology in our lives, with cell phones and computers and, and all of that sort of thing. And we know that we get these little notifications on those that it's time to update, right? And you, you click the update. And if you've ever had technology that's aged to the point where you'll get a little warning when you click that and say, well, this, this device can no longer use this operating system, right? Have you ever had that happen? Maybe I'm the only one who keeps phones long enough that, that, that. but, but what eventually happens when, when that is your reality and the operating system in your life doesn't update is that all the applications that you use on a regular basis become increasingly uh, ineffective. They, they, they stop working altogether because that which is there to tell them how to function, what they should be doing, doesn't align with the equipment that you're trying to use. There is an alignment between design and application. And this is James' point here. James is operating out of an understanding built on, on Old Testament wisdom literature that, that God, in his goodness and in his design as creator, has a specific purpose, an, an operating system, if you will, for how the world is supposed to work and our part in that and how it's ultimately designed to bring glory to God and how it's designed to be for our good and for our benefit. So James is, is, is borrowing now from, from the Old Testament, from the Proverbs, specifically if you look at Proverbs 1 through 9, if you read through that, you will hear, you will hear some of the same sort of argument or the same sort of um, 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 argument uh, <laughs> that, that he, James uses here in this letter. So he's borrowing from Proverbs. In fact, let's turn there real quick. This is Proverbs chapter 8. I just want to, I want you to see how James understands wisdom. And this, this section that I'm about to read, this is, this is written as if wisdom has been personified. So when you hear the speaking and you hear him saying, I, this is wisdom talking to us from, from Proverbs chapter 8. We'll pick it up in verse two, uh, 22 and read through the end of the chapter. Just, just hear this. It says, the Lord brought me forth as the first of his works. Before his deeds of old, I was formed long ages ago at the very beginning, when the world came to be. When there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the world or its fields or any of the dust of the earth, I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the foundations or the fountains of the deep. When he gave the sea its boundary so that the waters would not overstep its command. And when he marked out the foundations of the earth, I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. Now hear this. He says, now then, my children, so in light of that, in light of, of, of my 
watching wisdom's integral part in God's design from the very outset and eternity past. Now then, my children, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instructions and be wise. Do not disregard it. Blessed are those who listen to me watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me harm themselves, and all who hate me love death. See, see James' understanding of wisdom, his presentation of wisdom, is echoing here Proverbs chapter 8. With wisdom and understanding, according to James, is living in alignment with God's design and purpose. So in chapter 1, when James instructs the church and he says, ask God for wisdom, in 1 verse 5, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. This, James is instructing the church, pray, pray for alignment. God, show me how to live according to your design and your purpose. Align my heart with it. And then James, James concludes this with a promise. He said, that's a prayer that God will answer every single time without fail. So with this, this framework of understanding of what James was talking about when he talks about wisdom, let's take a moment now to look at this comparison and contrast between what we might call false wisdom or, or the wisdom of this world and true or godly wisdom. Let's begin by looking at false wisdom. I, uh, one of the privileges that, that Sherry and I have had over the years in ministry is opportunities when kids that have grown up in our youth group have graduated and, and are getting married. Um, and so oftentimes, especially when it's been a couple that's been close to us, we've had opportunity to sit down with, with the couple and talk about, um, about marriage and about life. And, and one of the conversations, especially when we're sort of in a pre official premarital counseling environment, is, is we'll sit down and we'll talk about the importance of understanding your default setting. You know what I mean by that? Like, the, we, we want them to understand that how all of us and our backgrounds and our experiences because of our parents and because of where we grew up and culture and, and because of our, our personalities and, and all of this makes up in us a, a default setting. And, and the thing that we need to understand about that is that in life, we will operate, whether it's good or bad, out of that default setting unless we actively choose not to. And so, for instance, in, in, in a marriage, if your default setting as it relates to conflict is, is avoidance, when there's conflict in the course of a marriage, you will avoid unless you understand, this is what I'm doing right now, and I'm going to choose, I'm actively going to choose to do something different. And it's important for us in, in all of our marriages to understand our, our default setting. Now, listen to what James says here. Look at this. This is back in, in 3, 14 and 15. He says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. See, the thing that, that we need to understand about what James is describing to us here as false wisdom is that this is our default setting. B because of sin, because of sin nature in our lives, this is where we will operate out of. This is how we will make decisions unless we have been transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ and we're living in step with the Holy Spirit. The wisdom that we will live out, that we will make decisions that will guide our lives will be just what James describes here. And there's a couple things that, that James points out to us here that's important for us to notice. First off, he says this, this sort of wisdom, this wisdom of the world, this is a wisdom that's all about you. The governing uh, authority of, of this wisdom in, is the self. And the result is, is marked or characterized, he says, by harboring bitter envy or selfish ambition. These, these are the driving motivators of this false wisdom, James says. So, so false wisdom orients everything around me. What's, what's best for me? 
What advances my agenda? What gives me the most power and the most control and the most satisfaction? What will elevate me? What, 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 what is ultimately going to glorify me? Because that's the end game. That, 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 according to this wisdom, is all there is. So we, we even have these quippy little phrases that we use in our culture that essentially illustrate that exact point. When we say things like, well, you've got to get yours, right? Like, that's what there is. That's what life is about. You've got to get yours. You have to get what is due you. So go out there and get it. You've earned it. You've whatever. Or we say things like, you do you. You are the uh, final authority in your life. Embrace it. And so whatever that looks like, apply that. That, that, that it is this, what James is teaching us, put down into a single phrase. And at the center of this, this understanding of the world and, 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 and of our lives is the God of me. And James says, don't, don't pretend otherwise. Don't, don't boast about your so-called wisdom. Don't, don't deny the truth that you're worshiping the God of self. So in true, true James fashion here, he, he sort of immediately goes after the heart of the matter. And he pulls no punches. He says, look, you're operating out of a system that's all about you. But then James goes on to help us recognize what, what this looks like. How do you see it and he says well this is is earthly it is unspiritual he says it's even demonic it's demonic to say that it's this is an earthly wisdom is is to say that this is a wisdom that that believes that operates out of a, a, a perspective that the here and now is all there is so this 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 false wisdom is is totally denying an eternal perspective and saying, this, this moment, right now, this is all there is for you. This is why, in contrast, when, when there are people who are living out of a wisdom that, that honors an eternal perspective, that sees that, and they're making decisions in their life, it can look so foreign and, and even foolish at times. It would not surprise me, some of you in this very place who are committed to generosity and you give regularly, you may have people in your life at different times when you're sending a kid to college or you're preparing for retirement to say, look, what are you, why are you giving money away? Why would you do that? You, you have events in life right now that, that are higher priorities. You need to be focused there. You're making a, a foolish decision. Some of you were, were just away last week in Toronto serving with our high school kids, giving away your lives together. Somebody might say, you used a week of vacation to go with high school students for a week to serve, to sleep on the floor, to eat whatever, and why would you do that? See, in, in, in the opposite of, of that sort of perspective, when the here and now is all that there is, those are foolish decisions. And James says it's earthly. He goes on to say that this is unspiritual. Other translations call this, they say it's a natural wisdom. By that it means it is totally void of the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding in your life. The Holy Spirit has no influence in this sort of wisdom. And then lastly, James says it's, it's demonic. Which again, you, 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 sometimes I read James and I think, he's so like over the edge a little bit, like... But, but what he means by that is that it's totally void of truth. This, this has been the very tool that Satan has used from the outset. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, when, when he is original sin is taking place, he, he comes with lies and says, God's holding out on you. You, you can't trust him. There's something better for you out there. The, the, the strategy hasn't changed all these years later. And so when when James is talking about this way of thinking, this false wisdom, and he calls it demonic, he's saying, this, this does not originate from God. This is a sort of wisdom that does not originate from God. And when we read these verses, it can sound so easily recognizable, so, and therefore avoidable, right? This, this earthly, this unspiritual, this demonic wisdom, we should be able to, to spot that and say, okay, I don't want to do that. But what we have to remember here, James is writing this to the church. So he's writing this to us. And he's saying, look, remember, church, this is your default setting. 
Remember, church, this, this worldly wisdom, this is the pond that you swim in. So, so this sort of way of thinking, this is mainstream, and it's familiar, and it's comfortable to us. And actually, to operate outside of this, this is what seems unique or different. So he's saying, be careful, church. Be careful that you don't live your life as if you are God and this is all that there is. Ultimately, James then shows us that destination. He calls it disorder in every evil practice, he says. Where the God of self is controlling our thinking, he's controlling our actions, the inevitable result is personal and societal chaos and every sort of sin. And I, I, think we, I think we know this. I think we experience this. And James, again, he's writing this to us. But now in contrast, he wants to show us what true wisdom looks like and what true wisdom produces. True wisdom. This is back in James 3, verse 17 and 18. But he says that wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So now, now in complete contrast to what James just described as this false wisdom, he says that true wisdom, real wisdom, finds its source in God, that it comes down from heaven. True wisdom, in, in contrast, not only recognizes the eternal in our lives, but it lives from that perspective. True wisdom operates with the knowledge that this isn't all that there is. It, it lives with, for something or rather someone greater. And it finds its source in the very person and character of God. And then, and then look what true wisdom produces, what the result of all of this is. Instead of saying this, this leads to disorder and, and to every evil practice, James says it produces purity. It's, it's peace-loving. It's considerate and submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who are reaping a harvest of righteousness. See, this is, this is one of the checks, then, that we, we look to see what system, what, what manner of living am I operating? What is my operating system? Is it producing these sorts of things? Or is it producing disorder in, in every evil practice? See, James is describing sanctification here to us. He is describing the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to transform us to more closely resemble Jesus. The result and the, the, uh, the choice to live out of the understanding that there is a God, that, that he is our authority, that he has a design and that he has a plan for us. And when we live according to that, that is when you and I begin to reflect his character. This is where, where true wisdom leads us to reap a harvest of righteousness, it says. When I was a, a, a kid, I, um, I had the opportunity to, um, well, my, my dad's uncle, so my great uncle, was a missionary in Kenya. In fact, he was um, one of the missionary doctors who started to establish a hospital in Kenya. His name's Charles Fraley. And, and at a time when there was very, very little available to the people in any sort of um, professional medical treatment. And what I didn't know about the story was that I had always, growing up, I'd always known him as Uncle Charles, who was a missionary in Kenya, and, and came back and sort of weird, like, wore these shirts that weren't, like, you know, culturally normal, and he's just kind of an odd dude, and, like, you know, and that was always my knowledge of Uncle Charles. And, and, uh, but what I discovered, and my grandma later told me, that, that his early adult life looked very much like ours. Matter of fact, it looked very much like the American dream, that, that he was a successful doctor, that he was providing for his family, that things were, were going well for him, and he was the surgeon, and, and yet in the midst of all of that, God played this very specific call on his life, and, and he decided to 
to sell everything that he owned, and he decided to pack up his entire family. And there was all sorts of people around him saying, Charles, what are you doing? It's not going to be safe there for your kids. Like, this is a horrible decision. Aren't you thinking about the future? Are you thinking about what this is going to mean? And yet he was undeterred. He sold everything that he had and packed everything they could pack. They took with them, they packed in suitcases and went to the airport. In fact, he, he drove his car to the airport not knowing what he was going to do with his car. He was like, I just guess I'm going to abandon it at the airport. And literally a man came up to him at the airport at uh, JFK in New York and said, God just told me I'm supposed to buy your car. And, and of course had cash with him to buy the car <laughs> and handed that. That's, that's a good indicator that maybe you're on the right path and that happens. But, but left all of that behind. And now um, in Nairobi, Kenya, there is a hospital that my uncle Charles started, my great uncle Charles. And it's almost impossible to measure the lives that have been impacted, that have been saved as a result of not only his leadership, but doctors who have come over to invest in this and surgeons and people making a life. And the whole thing makes no sense. The whole thing, in, in light of human wisdom, you'd say that was a foolish decision. But in light of eternity, um, in light of, of who God is and the, the call that he was placing on his life, there was no better decision he could make. And he left it all behind and he went because he was, he was operating out of a greater understanding of what his life was about and what it meant to follow Jesus. And he wanted to apply that no matter what the cost. As we, as we conclude this morning, I, just, I real quickly just want to share a couple thoughts. How, how do we grow in true wisdom? How do we grow in, in living and in, in identifying true wisdom and in, in, in avoiding false wisdom? Um, and, and this isn't rocket science. I, I heard another pastor share this in a sermon, and, and, and it, it sounded so obvious, but I think it's really, really true. And I would encourage you, if you're thinking, how do I, how do I increase in this? Three things, real quickly. One, grow in your understanding of the God of the Bible. Grow in your understanding of who he is and his character, and not this edited version that we come up with, where it's like, I, I take the parts that I like, and I, I sort of shape him into something that I can stomach, but take the unedited, uh, unaltered version of who God is, learn his character, know him, spend more time in his word, and understanding who he is and how he operates. Second, I would say grow in community. So, so people that are about that very thing, spend time with those people. There, there are those of you who are in this room right now who are in that community for me, who have opportunity and permission to speak into my life. And you do that, and I love that about you, and I'm so grateful for that, but we all need that. We all need peers around us who are growing in our understanding of the God of the Bible and who can speak truth into us and who can help us wrestle with things with, when it's unclear. And say, how do, we, how do we do this? And then lastly, I would encourage you to follow your godly leaders. Have people in your life who model this to you. People who you look at and you say, this is someone that I, when I think of living a wise life, of living this out, this person models that to me. Ask them questions. How did you get here? What, what ultimately, and, and when you're facing decisions, get their input their influence in your life. God has placed them there for you for a reason. And don't ignore that. The question that, that and in a room this size, there are probably many of us who are facing very real decisions where we need wisdom. It, it could be relational conflict, it could be a financial decision, a career move, a school choice, it could be all kinds of different things that we're facing in our life. And the question that, that we have to wrestle with is from which operating system will we make that decision? Am I going to, to pull from true wisdom, from an eternal perspective, from the source of who God is, or will I depend on, on the wisdom of this world? My, my hope and my prayer is that, that I will be, that we will be a church that, that seeks God and seeks to live in light of who he is. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you again for this community. I thank you that this is a part of, of the, um, the group of people that you have surrounded me with who will help me consider and know and understand what it means to live in light of you. 
God, I pray that we would continue to be a community that points each other to you and that you would be our source for every decision, big and small, that we would live in light of who you are of eternity. God, do this here. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus.